Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast. I'm your host, Roberto Massa, and today my guest is Chad Lee. Chad is an assistant professor of Spanish, early modern and medieval Spanish cultural studies at the University of Denver. I just want to mention that his work is uh, uh, at the intersections of religion, politics, gender, and race. And I want to mention one publication that we're going to talk about uh, together with uh, uh, Ken Tolley. Uh, they published a book, Jerusalem Afflicted, Quaresmius, Spain, and the Idea of a 17th Century Crusade. We're also going to talk about an upcoming uh, project. Uh, and I think this is like one of the most interesting aspects of the podcast, which is about uh, possessing Jerusalem, the holy city, and the invention of Spain. Chad, welcome. Thank you. Chad, the first question I always ask my guest is, what is your Jerusalem? In other words, what is your connection with the city? Um, I began my... Uh, my dissertation at Brown University uh, a while back, uh, and it was a study of the place of Jerusalem in early modern Spanish cultural production, in literature and in the political arena. Um, and so my first connection to Jerusalem was through was through books, through texts, um, through early modern, particularly late medieval and early modern texts. So. I read a lot. I read I read um, epic poetry, uh, travel travelogues, um, books of pilgrimage, um, uh, devotional treatises, maps, uh, all sorts of all sorts of uh, visual representations of the city. But I would say that 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 city is a very um, really artificial city uh, in a lot of ways. It's and it, it's a very removed from from my own experience, city, um, and I had people for years tell me um, how I was working on Jerusalem without going to Jerusalem, having never been there. How was I going to write about the city? And I think it's a good question, and I think it's something to think about. Uh, so a, f- a couple of years ago, I got a, f- a, f- a several grants and was able to to travel to Jerusalem, um, and I was there. Really, as a researcher, I was there to to spend most of my time in the archives of the Franciscan custody of the Holy Land that's there um, in the Holy in Old City, um, and uh, also the libraries of the of the custody. And so I was there as a researcher, um, and I spent pretty much all day archives. Um, I rented an Airbnb, maybe twenty minutes, a half an hour outside of the Old City. And uh, I walked into the city every day and spent my my time in studying and working. And then whenever I wasn't in the archives, I was walking, walking around the old city mostly, the, all the the quarters of the old city. And I I had a really, I have to say, I've still not entirely figured out my feelings about the experience because I I, I really really wanted to have uh, an emotional connection to the city. I'm having read so much about it and also reading about other people's responses, I, I just assumed that I would also have sort of a really visceral connection in that way or or something. But um, I think I struggled while I was there um, w- with this tension between being a participant in the, in the ritual and in the 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 life of of being in in that place and being an observer you know i felt a lot of the time like i was more like an ethnographer or an, or an anthropologist observing and thinking about things and um and less feeling myself in it um i think it's a beautiful very very complicated place um 
and having only spent a few weeks there, I really, I don't, I don't, I don't think I have enough enough time there yet to really say that I that I know what my Jerusalem is. I think that it's a it's a slippery place for me in that, that I I I left entirely understanding it, and I and I think I'm gonna have to go back uh, again uh, to get a better grasp on where I stand in 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 Jerusalem. Well, understanding contemporary Jerusalem is certainly a very hard job for not just scholars, but even for people living there. But I'm curious about something. You're an expert of 17th century. When you were around Jerusalem, did you see anything that was still connected to the period that you studied, uh, your knowledge about the city that you acquired through the text that you read? Did you see any hint or anything that was left of that early modern period? So one of the things that I um, I was really hoping to be able to see and I was able to see um, was um, a a very so the custody in in Jerusalem has a a very sizable collection of objects of cult um, that have been donated from European donors over the centuries. Largely royal donors, um, but um, referring to altar cloths, chalices, um, all sorts of um, mon monstrances, um, all sorts of d objects that were used in in religious practice and religious services and in ritual by the Franciscans, and um, those objects I think are very important um because they are part of a a very complicated economy of exchange between between catholic europeans and the franciscan custody and there's a very interesting political and economic dimension to that 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 maybe we'll we'll get to talk about but to your question um when i was there i was very graciously um helped by um some folks working in the custody who um who allowed me to see a number of of artifacts, objects that are that are still housed there, and these have also been on display. There was an there was a beautiful catalog published a few years ago, on the tre treasure of the Holy Sepulchre, um, in I think there's an English and a French version of it, um, an exhibit that went to Paris, I believe. Um, but I got to see some of the objects that came from Spain and specifically from 17th century Spain, and um, there are there is quite a number of of there are quite a number of things that are that are housed there still that are um, that are that harken back to that period that are from these exchanges of material things between Spain and the Holy Land in the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, the most memorable one, um, a couple actually. I went to to uh, they invited me to a mass that was being um, that was being said in. In the the rotunda, right right under the in in, in the holy sepulchre, the altar, the, the front of the altar um, for that for that mass, they they adorned it with a very very large um, like a bas relief silver um, silver piece that covered the front of the altar, which was from the period of Philip the um, Fourth, and who was who was who reigned in Spain um, in the early mid mid 17th century and um they also showed me um a <laughs> after a different mass that i attended absolutely gargantuan um object which was uh a gold um i don't remember now exactly what it was I, i'm only remembering what it looks like um i don't know if it was a monstrance um, it might have been a monstrance, but it was a huge, huge piece. I, it stood many feet tall, all made of gold and silver, um, engraved with the name of Philip IV, this same, this same monarch that I'm mentioning, also encrusted with gems and jewels and, and things. Um, and just a really tremendously ostentatious piece of, of um, royal performance of... Uh, devotion to the holy places um, sent from the king of Spain to the Franciscans. Uh, 
and uh, that's just one one piece, but also some vestments and some other things that were from that same period. So I'd, I'd say that those those artifacts really stuck with me because they're so they're so striking. The the rich material culture from that period, that not only is it there, you know, as museum pieces, but the the friars that are that are there continue to use those pieces, um, some of them anyway, in in their in their ceremonies up to the present day, which I think is really interesting um that they that they get brought out for for special occasions so um that was probably my my own my own personal response to that question is is those artifacts really really stuck out they were they're they're very very impressive and they're part of this huge um exchange of things sent uh from spain from other places from italy from all over to um to the franciscans in the holy sepulcher in particular yeah, I just want to mention uh, to the listeners that uh, the Custody of Holy Land is a Catholic uh, uh, run by Franciscan institution. In fact, probably one of the oldest religious institutions in the city. And essentially it works uh, like an international corporation because uh, by statute, um, the various roles are basically appointed according to nationality. So the custos which would be uh, sort of a, the leader uh, is Italian or must be Italian, in fact. And then a number of other roles are, are covered by Spanish and then by the French, uh, English, Americans and so forth. So every nationality has essentially a place uh, in the ruling of the uh, custody of the Holy Land. And their job is essentially to protect the holy places in the broader Holy Land, which includes um, uh, what nowadays is Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, parts of Syria, and even Cyprus. Um, this is a fascinating institution, and the treasure preserved uh, in the archives and in, I would call it the vaults are uh, just inimaginable. I, uh, like you did, I did to work uh, several times there, and uh, I could only scratch the surface of the material, uh, you know, that they have, and. And I think one of the most important aspects of the custody is that essentially ever since the 13th, 14th century, they they have records, they have material of, you know, their work in the city and in the region. So it's, it's an amazing source. Having said that, I wanted to ask you something about um, Jerusalem in the 17th century. I, I must admit, I don't know much other than obviously uh, Ottomans took over from the Mamluks. But other than that, and, you know, the question of uh, of the walls uh, and obviously redesigning and pouring some money the economy of a city, but I must admit that I don't know much. And in fact, uh, I feel like there is an historiographical gap. So I was wondering through your readings, uh, how was Jerusalem entry? century? I, well, I have to preface this answer by saying that my my own understanding of that question is uh, definitely biased by the sources that I'm that I'm familiar with. So I um, I work with Spanish Catholic sources primarily, um, sometimes Italian sources, um, things in Latin, but that leaves a huge a huge gap in in my my understanding of the period because I'm not working in Arabic and I'm not really working with Ottoman sources. Um, so I, although I can read, I can, you know, I can read a translated collection of Firmans or something and, uh, and get a sense of things. Um, the sources that I most work with are, are these, um, Spanish sources. So having said that, um, um, so if you read those sources and I'm referring to, um, both of the archive at the custody as well as the Archivo Histórico Nacional in Madrid, um, they have a whole section of documents um, that that are part of the Obra Pia de los Santos Lugares, which which I hopefully we can talk about later on, which is a um, a sort of dependent agency within the Spanish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And what I would say generally about all these all these sources is the picture that you get from the city from the Catholic Spanish perspective in the period is that place because it was under Ottoman control. Um, there were Ottoman authorities who, and this is, I think, still the case that, you know, technically 
oh, the the keys to the to the sepulcher. Um, that the, but there were in in lots of different ways movements in and out of out of sanctuaries and through the city were constrained by Ottoman authorities who, according to these sources, often described them as very ex. There's lots of extortion and bribery and money that needs to be paid for fines, for infractions, for just entering and leaving places. So it's a it's a huge money suck that's constant. And there's also a very um, tense relationship between Franciscans and other Christian um, communities in in the Holy Sepulchre, in particular. The, the Greek Orthodox community is, is represented as 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 absolute incarn incarnations of evil. They're always out to plot against the Franciscans, to take away territory, to undermine their efforts. Um, there are um, a similar similarly applied to the Jewish community of of the Jews conspiring with the Greek them out of certain places. Um, so the feeling that these is is that the Franciscans are in great need of help, that they're in a great dire situation, that they're they're being abused physically, they're being hauled off to prison or beaten for things, um, they're being extorted. Um, there's a, there's an account in one letter, one of these letters I mentioned, where uh, a lower level Ottoman official comes to the sepulchre, demands wine from the friars who can't not give it to him because they don't and then when they do give it to him are then punished because they gave wine to him so um that kind of that kind of damned if you do damned if you don't um caught between a rock and a hard place um rhetoric is is uh is a really really uh core element of so many accounts of the city spanish franciscan 17th century perspective it's it's a it's a city that's marked mostly by tension between this community and other groups in the city and like i said physical violence and uh uh anxieties around money are super constant in these texts looking at sources just a few centuries later you find the same light motive essentially Franciscans complaining uh, about the Ottoman authorities, and obviously you you have plenty of examples about physical violence between uh, Christian denominations. And certainly, uh, I personally collected material about uh, incidents either in Jerusalem or in Bethlehem between the two. Uh, those included uh, casualties; people died essentially. Uh, yeah. It, the, there, there. That, that's absolutely, and that that concords with my own experiences too. Uh, one, one really. This is to tie this this thread we're we're following now with what we we talked about earlier about the the beautiful collection of in the in the Holy Sepulcher. Um, Philip the Third, who who reigned from 1598 um, until 1621. Um, I think 1621. My Hispanist colleagues will murder me if I get wrong the death of Philip III. But um, <laughs> anyway, Philip III sent to the Franciscans an absolutely gargantuan um, silver, pure silver um, lamp that was sent to the sepulcher to hang in front of the in front of the the tomb. And uh, by all accounts, there's multiple. Um, archival accountings of this object and it was it was massive and it's described as the envy of other communities and the greatest thing that was ever received as a gift um at the end of the century i don't know if it was right at the end of the seven the, the 1700s or right at the beginning of the 1800s there was a there was a large um conflict between the different christian communities in the holy sepulcher that was described most more or less as a riot in um in contemporary sources with you know friars beating each other up and people getting thrown around and in the context of that violence um where people got hurt and you know damage was done inside of the sepulcher um this huge uh this huge silver lamp was was like thrown on the ground and destroyed and broken into multiple pieces um so they ended up sending it back to spain had it re re melted and uh, recast into some some candelabras that were then resent back to the sepulcher and those are still actually in the, the 
the in the in the church there and um in the custody but um but yeah it's just an example of like a like a an all out just a, a battle <laughs> between between people in the holy sepulcher and, and those kinds of things are are not uncommon in the sources that i work with well and at a lower degree those battles are still there i mean there's been a change of pace and a change in the language but uh, you know we're still there in many ways <laughs> i want to ask you i think something. so european has had an interest in jerusalem for different reasons in different ways uh, titles uh, you know the, the the throne of a king of jerusalem or properties or protections over uh, the various christian communities when we think about 21st century it's hard to think about spain and jerusalem so what was the relationship between spain and jerusalem back then how how come spain was so interested in uh, uh, in jerusalem that's a phenomenal question um the answer is maybe a little long but i'll, I'll try to i'll try <laughs> i'll try to give a a good answer um and and this in this narrative that I'm about to to tell you, I, I is a narrative that is in the 21st century official state discourse. It's a, it's it's a part of how Spanish um, official accounts of its of of the Spanish royal past continue to um, memorialize and remember uh, the 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 connection an intimate connection between Spain and Jerusalem that dates back many 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 centuries and so that history um, you can find for example in the Boletín Oficial de Estado which is the official state bulletin in Spain where official acts of the government are published um, I mentioned earlier the the pious work of the holy places the Ora Pia de los Santos Lugares is a is a um, an organism that still exists it's been sort of secularized and neutered in a little bit of a way but it's still there as an as an official piece of the government um and in both official state bulletin um you know for example when they have to you know re um renew the the annual budget for example and there's something that alludes to the to the obra pia um you you encounter this rehearsing of the narrative that spain has had over the course of many, many centuries, a very, very intimate, very close and very meaningful connection between the Spanish crown and Jerusalem as a city, as a place, as a sacred place. Um, and in particular, also between Spanish crown and the Franciscan custody. So those connections that you see in these sources that up to even the 21st century, um, they really harken back to the 14th century um, during the period when the Aragonese crown was invested heavily uh, in uh, in the 15th century in particular, expanding into the Mediterranean. And I say the 14th century because in the 14th century, um, Robert of Mallorca, um, who were the monarchs in Naples, um, they were the, um, they were also the titular, uh, he was, Robert of Anjou was the king of Jerusalem as well, um, through a, a complicated series of claims and, you know, there, there are no shortage of claims to the throne of Jerusalem in the period, but Robert of Anjou in Naples claimed the throne of Jerusalem. And not only that, but Robert and Sancha also negotiated with the Mamluk um, Sultan um, th for the purchase of the, m the material properties that would become the foundation for the Franciscan custody. So uh, Robert of Anjou and Sancho of Mallorca, they're, they're, the, the custody um, wouldn't necessarily have the form that it has because they um, donations or those initial, you know, material places, and there's a there are a couple of papal bulls that recognize this, like Gratis Agimus um, is the probably the most uh, instant. Uh, if you go, you know, even if you go to the website of the custody, it's still sort of there's a history that re that references that, right? So um, where Aragon comes into this is that Aragon in the in the 15th century, in, in particular, 14th century, 15th century was was a maritime dynasty expanding uh, very forcefully into the Mediterranean. 
and conquering territories and sort of spreading their <laughs> spreading their their commercial uh, and, and and maritime empire across to the east. And um, as part of that, uh, they eventually acquired Naples, the king, the kingdom of Naples. And when they did that, a lot of the same uh, claims to Jerusalem that had been part of the ne the Neapolitan crown, such as the claim to the throne of Jerusalem, and also this foundational claim of having established the Franciscan custody itself, those claims were absorbed by the Aragonese crown. Aragon sort of appropriated those as part of a royal patrimony that then became part of Aragon's patrimony. And when the Catholic monarchs, Ferdinand and Isabel, were were, were married and uh, united the crowns of Aragon and Castile, and and you know this is a sort of complicated thing, but um, it, you know m modern Spain has its origins around around that period, and there's different ways we can account for that or, or think about it. Um, and even talking about Spain in the singular in this period is a little bit problematic, but I'll just say that. Um, Spain, uh, under Ferdinand and Isabel, also um, under the, under the, the under Ferdinand and Isabel, these these same claims to a super intimate connection to possession of the Holy City as monarch of Jerusalem and also um, protector and patron and foundational sort of a of the Franciscan custody. Both of those Neapolitan claims became part of Spanish patrimony. And in the context of the of of the Italian wars of the 15th and 16th century, which were kind of a big messy, messy business um, involving especially Spain and France, um, there were a lot of competing cl claims over this. But in 1510, the investiture of the the those the the title of King of Jerusalem um, was formalized by. Um, I forgot which pope right now, but um, that's that's irrelevant. But um, the the pope was the pope invested the the Spanish crown with this this title of you know king of king of Naples, king of the two Sicilies, and also king of Jerusalem as part of that sort of package. And um, from that period forth, that was in 1510. Um, we can see uh, that in the in for example in the in the Spanish Constitution of 1978, which was which was uh, which was ratified after um, the death of Franco and part of the transition to democracy in Spain, that um, that the historical titles that the king that the crown possesses are are still allowed to be used. And so, in that way, um, in an official sort of legislative sense, even um, the king of Spain today, Philip VI, is is officially in from a Spanish perspective the King of Jerusalem. That's one of his official titles. Um, but I also mentioned something that's really important, which is the the obra pia and this this claim to the the this this foundational connection to the Franciscan custody. And on that side, um, what is really really undeniable. You mentioned earlier that the custody has a sort of division of labor between different nationalities. That you know the 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 French or Italian or Spanish positions that were rotating um, were always fulfilled by people in from those from those places, right? Um, the Spanish uh, job in the custody was basically to operate as the sort of money person, the the person who who ran accounts, the and and in that sense um, that. That foundational connection to the economics of the custody created from early on from the a very, very interesting connection where the Spanish crown saw itself as the the principal supporter, the principal um, uh, financer of the activities of the custody. they They really viewed themselves in in those terms as without the Franciscan, without the the Spanish, material support of just act raw money as well as material objects such as you know wax uh wine grain without those material supports sent from spain um to the custody the custody would simply not be able to operate 
And so um, I recently published an article about one, just one document where we see this narrative. But in that document, an argument made that if Spain were to stop supporting the custody in the way that it has historically, and this is a document from 16, uh, I think 1609 or 1604, 1604 to 1605, that's when it's from, um, that uh, without the Spanish support, this, the custody would cease to exist, that it, it, the custody exists only because Spain continues to pay for the custody's activities. And while there might be some support that comes from Rome and there might be some alms that come from Genoese or Venetian or French or other people, it, Spain is the one that really, really pays for, for the majority of the things. And in, to be truthful, um, if you look at the, the financial records of the period in the 17th century, that does seem to be the case that most of the most of the money that flowed into the custody a, a very significant proportion of that money came from spain um that function of the of the spanish state it became not just part of the monarchy but it became part of the sort of bureaucracy of a modern state um and this happened under uh, a king named charles the third and and there are there's an interesting document where he um, he decrees that this is now that, that this this alms providing this support of the custody is something that is central to this to the operation of the government and that it's um, it's going to be you know taken over by you know the the bureaucracy basically um, and so into the you know the 18th 19th centuries. Um, by the by, the 19th century, we be, we get what you know what would then become the the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Spain, and is now the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Cooperation. Um, and that thing that that was these charitable um, devotional donations and material support over the course of centuries um, became uh, institutionalized as the Obra Pia de los Santos Lugares, the the pious work of the holy places that's the name of that organization inside of the ministry of foreign affairs and the ora pia has continued to operate and what up into the present the ora pia um, has evolved in its mission and, and in the present day it, it's viewed as more sort of a a group that uh, a place to house diplomatic activity um, between spain and and the Holy Land, in a, in a sense, but um, uh, so it, and it's really sort of lost its some of its um, more explicit framing as part of Catholic devotional practice. There's an article that came out a couple of years ago um, outlining the kind of progressive secularization of the Orapia because you know it's called it's called the bias work of the holy places, so it's hard to secularize something with a name like that. But that's uh, it, it has. Um, it has become, um, a, a, you know, a fixed element of the Spanish state up into the present. And so, it, it on those terms, just on the sort of in terms of diplomacy and in terms of economics and in terms of material connections and also in terms of what from the Spanish side is a legal argument that um, the, the 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 Pope recognized and invested the King of Spain with this title, and so now it's an official part of the Spanish crown. For all of these reasons. Um, Spanish sources over the course of centuries insist on a really, really special and important connection between Spain and the Holy Land. Spain, the King of Spain literally is the King of Jerusalem. He literally possesses the material places that are the Holy City and the Ottoman or Mameluk or whatever presence there, I suppose later British and whatever, that those, those are Less so in the present with with the, the modern state of Israel, but that rightfully Spain owns Jerusalem, and the fact that the Ottomans are in Palestine is just an accident of history, or of divine retribution, or of or whatever things. But the fact that that they are there and not the King of Spain is an an aberration. It's a problem, and it's and it's an anomaly. And as sort of aside aside from that, this whole this whole material part as well. That's the progressive um, institutionalization of these connections has really guaranteed that that has also remained a really important part of 
how Spanish sources uh, view this long, long history. So like I said sort of at the beginning of this long little speech here, um, this whole account that I just gave you in a, you know, a two or three paragraph form, you can still find it rehearsed before official state documents that mention the Orapia, they mention this whole history. They say, you know, from since since the 14th century when Robert, Robert of Anjou and Sanchez Mallorca founded the custody and that became part of Aragon, our monarchs have been those who have kept the, the custody going. And have had claims to the throne of Jerusalem for centuries. And so even, you know, even in, you know, the 21st century, you can still find that that narrative. I want to I want to interrupt you here because one thing that I remember, um, was that like a few years ago, there was still a, a debate uh, in Italy. Obviously, we don't we no longer have a monarch in Italy, but when the uh, the monarchs were readmitted uh, after decades, you know, they've been uh, kicked out after World War II. One of the titles that they claim was to be the king of Jerusalem, and I remember that all you know triggered all of these debates about who's the uh, you know who's the real king of Jerusalem, whether it's the Spanish uh, monarch or you know the, the claims goes to the Italians because they had it from before. And I said, okay, uh, <laughs> it was just <laughs> fascinating that there were all of these claims about. Uh, uh, a throne that does no longer exist. But I, I suppose, particularly in Spain, and that was my experience working with uh, Spanish material, uh, and particularly because of the presence of the Obra Pia that you mentioned, there is still a deep connection, uh, which I found extremely interesting. Oh, no, I was saying, yeah, absolutely. And I think that even even th through the 19th, 20th, up to the present 20th centuries, um, there has there has been a, a a Spanish cohort of friars that are are continue to carry the banner of a sort of national pride over over all these connections. They're they're very proud of of these connections and very proud of the of the things that have, in a sense, uh, you know, entre comillas, be belonged to Spain. Um, you know, bu buildings and and sanctuaries that were founded by or or paid for by this the. National pride among the Franciscans in in Jerusalem over the course of you know many, I want to say even generations, but de decades. Um, there's been a, a Spanish cohort in in the Holy City that's kept that flame going. We are going to take a short break. Thank you for listening, and remember to join our Facebook page, Twitter, and Instagram account. If you have a story about Jerusalem that you want to share, or someone that you want me to. Please get in touch. Enjoy the rest of the show. This is a unique form of colonialism, honestly, because it's uh, it's not about possession of land, of control of land, but it's more about uh, some sort of image, uh, you know, sort of belonging to a place and connecting the city with the, with the history of a country. I have two more questions and very much about your work, the one that you are working on, and maybe a short uh, uh, sort of a question about uh, the previous work. In your current work, you're talking about possessing Jerusalem, and essentially you're already talking about this, this idea of the holy city and connected to Spain, but you also use this very powerful word, the invention of Spain. So my question is, how does Jerusalem actually contribute to uh, you know, the invention of Spain. How does this relationship work? I think it's, uh, like, you, like you said, it is a very complicated and, and, and in a sense, strange form of colonialism because of, of the fact that there might be a territorial claim built into this, but it's, it's um, there's an intangible element as well, the sort of symbolic capital of possessing the most sacred site on in, in human history, in the most sacred material location on the planet, um, having a having a connection to that, and in a in a sense, is an, is an interesting form of control and and, and an exercise of power. I've, um, so, but yeah. Anyway, uh, I think that the uh, the way to answer your question is uh, that it, it's a complicated question, right? But I, I would say that the the primary way that the the holy city 
um, serves to imagine what is Spanish essence. What is what is the the nature of Spain? Who are Spaniards? What is Spanishness? Um, has to do with a claim to a particular sort of holiness, um, a particular sort of specialness of a, a kind of no, notion of chosen chosen people. Maybe um, there's definitely a big supersessionist um, logic in this that that Spain are Spain is in the in the 16th and 17th century that Spaniards are the new Israelites the new the new chosen people that's not a unique phenomenon to Spain you know everybody wants to be the new chosen people and the new the new Israelites um and that's a very mobile a mobile idea as well um but it was a very potent one in Spain so um I think that in in uh in lots of ways the the Discourses and practices, which are are material, you know, as we've seen in political and and legal and diplomatic and economic, um, and also that take place very very much in the realm of cultural production and in literature and in the, in the world of ideas and in in visual material, you know, um, representations of the city. Um, this whole vast array, there's like a sea of materials that, in all sorts of different ways are constantly sort of crying out that Spain owns Jerusalem. So what those, what all these materials are doing in, in all these different genres is in different ways, creating an entire sort of cultural and political and social matrix where the idea that Spain has a special connection to Jerusalem becomes uh, a very, very important part of of the world, the 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 way that things are in in 16th and 17th century Spain. This is the same period um, when Spain was engaged in all sorts of processes of imagining a, a religious and also ethnic racial purity for itself that is uh, really, really essential. So um, as you'll recall, Spain, uh, the, 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 the Jews of uh, Iberia, Sephardic Jews were were expelled from from Spanish realms in 1492. Um, the the Nazareth, the last Muslim dynasty in the, in the Iberian Peninsula, was also uh, conquered by Ferdinand and Isabel in 1492. And in the subsequent years, not too too long after that, all of the descendants of the Muslims who were living in uh, in in Spain were forcibly converted to Catholicism. Um, and this follows the massive conversions of um, of Jews from 1391 onwards. In these uh, these mass conversions, coupled with um, you know the the colonial project in the Indies, where conversion was also really really important, um, they all coalesce to create a, a society which was also heavily policed, right, through the organization of the institution, a society that was very fixated on forms of imagining purity, forms of imagining purity in terms of religious practice of orthodoxy, but also forms of purity in terms of blood in a sort of biological, genetic, um, racialized sense of, of identity. There was a sense that um, you had to be pure, pure of blood. Limpieza y sangre um, was a, was a, you know, blood, blood cleanliness was a not just a discourse or an idea, but it was actually like a bureaucratic procedure as well. You had to demonstrate um, through documents that you had no ancestors who were um, in order to have access to certain um, official charges, of official posts to do certain, certain things, to enter into certain, you know, groups or societies. Um, so that sort of, mm, in, uh, I, I don't want to say obsessive, but obsessive, yes, obsessive <laughs> fixation on notions of purity, whether religious or or racial, ethnic, in terms of blood, um, has uh, is is really really draws strength. I I argue also from Spanish connections to Jerusalem. It's not just that 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 Spain is looking for a sort of um, homogenous. Visigothic Roman Catholic 
pure populace as as the people that are these new chosen people. It's also that those chosen people that are these pure people also happen to be the same people who literally own Jerusalem, who literally have claims to the place wherein the you know the the redemption of humanity was wrought by the death and resurrection and those kinds of ideas. And so that um, that connection to the holy city, I think, is a really really potent driver of these these ideas. And and it's not just in the context of an of an autochthonous project project where having you know deriving um, inspiration from its own claims to the holy city, but it's also a, a tool for international relations as well. And I think this is very interesting. It's not just that Spain's people internally are are being um, cast as a special or pure. Um, it's also that Spain relationally on an international scale is also using Jerusalem to position itself. Jerusalem is a tool through which Spain positioned itself on, on a geopolitical level, um, both in its relationship to the Ottomans, which is kind of obvious in, in the Eastern Mediterranean, and to Maghrebi polities all across, you know, North Africa, with which Spain had constant, you know, conflict, and and there were explicit um, crusading uh, in the early 16th century, cr even you know, explicitly cast as crusade efforts to take places, um, conquer places in in North Africa, and that's a really really important part of the colonial project as well. But not just not just the the Muslim um, other, let's say, of Spain, um, but also um, a way of of mediating or relating to Christian polities as well, and especially with France, because France has such an intimate connection to crusade and to the holy city. Um, there was a lot of rivalry that was worked out through claims to Jerusalem in this period. So claiming Jerusalem, saying you own Jerusalem, saying that you are specially connected to Jerusalem is also a way of saying that uh, of of controlling and of casting how your relationship is to the Ottomans, how your relationship is to the French or to the Venetians or the, the Genoese or to other people. And um, in all these ways, it's a really, really potent um, trope to say, you know, Spain owns Jerusalem. It's a, it's a way of, of asserting ethno-racial religious purity within Spain. And it's also a way of saying that Spain is superior. So Spain the argument on a global level as well that Spain is like the best of all Catholic nations because nobody else has Jerusalem and Spain is destined also to conquer the Ottomans and to place you know a new a new Catholic uh, presence in the, in the holy city um, and that kind of narrative um, we see in in different sources it seems like a it feels like a very early 16th century narrative if you know Spanish stuff um, the kind of, um, especially the pr prophetic stuff, um, or, you know, around the time of Columbus, for example, there's there's a great book by Alain Milieu about his uh, relationship to these discourses of of prophecy and the the possession of Jerusalem. Um, but uh, it really it really lasts far 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 longer than you would expect. And and when I first began this work, I I really thought, okay, this is gonna Maybe the reign of, you know, Ferdinand and Isabel, Charles V, maybe Philip II. Maybe if we're lucky, it can get a little Philip III up until, you know, 16, early 1600s. But no, this thing, this these kinds of ideas continue through the reigns of... The, and then you'd think, okay, well, this is a Habsburg thing. But shortly after the the War of Succession and, and the the... the 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 peace of Utrecht and all that at the beginning of the 18th century, there there continue to be th this insistence on these narratives. There's a really interesting history written by uh, a friar, but I want to say 1712 or somewhere in there. I'm not really exactly sure of the year now, but um, in which he rehearses all these same things and he reminds the monarch, listen, you're the king of Spain, your ancestors, people whose throne you now inhabit are those who have kept the the custody going and that sort of argument continues as i said through the you know charles the third in the 18th century and you continue to see it in sources up until the 20th century when there's a massive i think um recalibrating of this and reappropriating of it 
um, obviously for the, the the national Catholic discourses of of Francism, um, Francoism, the the you know General Franco's dictatorship of the 20th century. Um, really, really loved the idea of crusade of of the national Catholic project as a crusade, and not only that, but in the you know in the 1950s, for example, in 1954, 55, um, Franco oversaw an exhibit of the Holy Land that took place in Madrid in the in the, the Parque del Buen Retiro in, in downtown Madrid, um, where they transported literally thousands of artifacts of archaeological remains. Um, they had um, they, they had they had water brought from literally from the River Jordan. They had literal sheep transported from the countryside in Bethlehem to Madrid that were on this topic. They also had um, they had a, uh, a number of um, physical recreations. There was a life-sized model, for example, of the, the aticule, the, 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 the structure of the tomb that's inside of the rotunda, inside of the Holy Sepulchre. The life-sized, basically making a new Jerusalem literally in Madrid. Um, and that, that, that thing lasted for over a year, that exhibit. Um, but as part of that exhibit, there was also a a hall of uh, one of the halls in the exhibit dedicated to memorializing the particular connection between the Spanish monarchy and all of this. That Spain, in a sense, this this exhibit casts Franco as the inheritor of that same legacy. And you know, Franco only died in the 70s, and so since the since the 70s, there's been maybe some some sort of uncomfortable. Um, either ignoring or not reckoning with this legacy, but um, I I have to say that the the resurgent far right movement, in particular the the Vox party that has is really sort of frightening right now in Spain, they're very much also invested in these narratives of Spanish um, Spanish purity, a sort of ethno racial uh, Catholic purity that rejects immigrants, that rejects Islam, that rejects Judaism. Um, that's an area that I need to to work a little bit more in, but I'm I'm very certain that in in certain contexts that the 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 connection between Spain's relationship with Jerusalem and the presence in the present in Spain is something that that they're they're aware of and that they they derive, you know, pleasure from and and uh a sense of power from really a sense of entitlement and a sense of supremacy over other people who don't have that special connection. For the past maybe three decades or so, there's been an attempt by historians to give back agency to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, even looking back at earlier history in order to include Jerusalemites. But I think now we come, we just arrived to a point that we forget that uh, uh, and we forgot, in a sense, that uh, actually Jerusalem uh, is still part of uh, many different cultures and you know around the world. Uh, they these countries have appropriated Jerusalem in different ways. Um, and sometimes we, I, I, I just realized when you were talking about it that I mean we we need also to add that element in order to understand the city itself because there is a real Jerusalem where people live at their daily businesses but there's also this projected Jerusalem and uh, it's something that defines the ways in which we understand the city and we understand also you know those countries um, so th you can't really understand Jerusalem without it and I guess you can't really understand in this case Spain without understanding Jerusalem and I think this is like uh, uh, not just fascinating, but very important. I have one last question, and I, I want to go back to your first work that you published with uh, Professor Ken Tully. So I know that you work together, and I'm only asking you out of curiosity uh, a brief description of this very interesting individual, Quaresmius. My understanding is that he was born in Italy, in Lodi, uh, not far away from uh, actually where I grew up, but I must admit I never heard of him, of course. Um, <laughs> And my understanding is Spanish uh, crown, and essentially he called for a crusade in the 17th century. Uh, who was he? Why calling for a crusade? Uh, what was his goal? 
yeah, it's a he's, he is a really fascinating character. I mentioned him earlier. He's he's best known for this two volume um, this two volume work that is um, a history of the uh, of the holy places, and it's it's you know it's it's printed in folio, it, it, two columns. It's all in Latin. It's a very very difficult work that very few people have have studied. In 1626, Quaresmus was, um, at the time, um, living in Jerusalem. He lived in Jerusalem on a number of occasions. He also traveled widely throughout um, you know, Syria and Egypt and other places. He was on a he was on a papal mission at, at one point for um, you know to um, strengthen ties with the Chaldeans and Maronites, and um, so he he had a a number of different roles that that connected him to the custody and to uh, Christianity in the East. Um, but in 1626, he delivered this sermon to Philip the Fourth, who is the monarch I've mentioned a few times. And this sermon um, was printed in Milan in 1631. And he it, it has never been <laughs> since 1631. Uh, as far as I can tell, no one uh, has really read this work very much. Uh, I don't know uh, of any scholars up until the present day, aside from Marianne, who who I just mentioned, um, who has ever cited it directly. Um, I have found allusions to its existence as a title in bibliographies or on a footnote saying, for example, here's an example of crusading in the 17th century. Um, but without any sort of engagement with it. So I, I, with the help of a dear friend, um, Paula Plastich, who's doing her PhD right now at, at Davis, um, and and also with some funding, I I ended up going to the Ambrosiana in in Milan, which is where this this text is housed in a unique copy. It's it, at the time I went there, we thought it was the only one in the world. It turns out there's one in Buenos Aires as well, which I also got my hands on. But this very, very unique document um, is this, is an account of, it's a, it's a plea uh, from Quaresmius to the king of Spain, begging him to conquer the holy city. And in that plea, um, he invokes many of these same narratives that I've been mentioning. So he he, he frames Philip as, as the king of Spain and as... The patron and protector of holy places through his connections to the custody. He also mentions in the context of the sermon that Philip is the um, the grand master of the order of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre, which was something that is a little bit debatable because it, that there was a move in the 17th century to to name Philip II as the grand master of that order, and that that wasn't ratified in Rome. But that doesn't mean that the crown didn't like to assert that they were grand masters of the order of knights of the holy sepulcher anyway so um so in 1626 this this very long it's a 74 page um sermon uh lays out the the case that the king of liberate jerusalem from ottoman tyranny and uh, it's cast in the voice of of uh, personified jerusalem she's a woman who's pleading for her own liberation um and she casts uh philip as as her as her as the person that can save her in in that way um it's a it's a complicated text and lots of um lots of things i, I really won't get into here but uh i would say that what's what's interesting about this case is that it's not entirely unique um there's also uh set an from the the previous monarch philip iii there's a there's a letter from a, an uh, Italian Franciscan writing in Italian to the King of Spain um, in 1603, I believe, uh, also calling on the King of Spain to to take uh, take up the the cross and and conquer the holy places. These authors I mentioned, um, both of whom are Italian, um, are very convinced in their in their texts that for important strategic reasons as well. The King of Spain is is the person who can do this because he has a large armada and a powerful army and he's 
asserted a sort of global dominance in territories around the world and that the moment is ripe for him to embrace his destiny as the titular king of Jerusalem and actually lay claim to that to that to that uh, to that crown to that throne um, by conquering Jerusalem. Esto era el profesor Chad Lee. Gracias. Or oh, if I need a translation, this was uh, Professor Chad Lee. Thank you very much for being with us at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thank you so very much for having me. It was a pleasure. Thank you for listening to Jerusalem Unplugged. This podcast is currently commercial free. There are no ads. The only possibility to stay this way is for you to please let your friends, your family and others who may be interested in listening to Jerusalem Unplugged know about this podcast. Let's increase the audience and let's keep the podcast commercial free. Thank you for listening. Until the next one. <laughs>